Okay, here we are. Um, we started last week on uh, normal distributions and how IQ tests have changed from, thank you, <laughs> boy, they're really good at anticipating me, how IQ tests have changed from, <coughs> wait, using this method to, uh, excuse me, using this method to calculate an IQ test to using uh, normal distributions, okay? Now, and we talked about, we talked about how there's this, come back to me if you can, this sort of coming together in the history of statistics and statistical, uh, statistics and measurement, there's a sort of this coming together of the idea of a normal distribution and standard deviations. And we talked about how just, it's just a universal constant, just like the, the circumference of a circle divided by its diameter is always the same answer. Let's go back to the overhead. The, yeah, the overhead, the PowerPoint, I mean, that when you, when, if, and only if, I'll scream it again when I scream it's important, only if you have a normal distribution, you find a very steady distribution of the scores. I know it may be hard to see on this screen, but 34% of the scores are within the mean and the score that's one standard deviation from the mean. 13.5, now we've run up to 14, are between one and two standard deviations from the mean. And three are, and about a little over two are between two and three standard deviations. Likewise on the other side. 34% of the scores are between the mean and minus ones, and one standard deviation below the mean. About 13.4, 14 are between one and two, and two below, and then a little over 2% between 2 and 3 below, and then another half percent off here are more than, less than 3, are, are less than 3 standard deviations below the mean, 3 or more standard deviations above the mean. Okay, come back to me if you can. Okay, now, so what we have here then, what we have is, again, it, we have the idea of a mean, which is the average of the scores, and we have the idea of a standard deviation, which is an average of how much, of, of how big a, the average deviation from the scores, right? So if we have scores clustered around the mean, we have a small standard deviation. We have scores all over the place. We have a large standard deviation, right? It's the average amount that a score varies from the mean. So this score varies two points from the mean. This score varies 18 points from the mean. They have an average variation of 10 points from the mean, right? You understand what I'm saying? So, and of course, initially that was used to describe, initially that was used to describe differences in populations, right? This class has a 78 average, and that class has an 88 average. Well, we know, okay, the one with the 88 average, the students on the average did better. Even though we know probably, it's very likely the person with the highest score in the 78 average had a higher score than the person with the worst score in the class with 78 average. Also, if I say these two classes both had a, uh, an 82 average, but this one had a standard deviation of four, three points, this one had a standard deviation of seven points, I know that in the first class, the scores are very tightly clustered. In the second class, they're, right, they, they're spread out. What's more, of course, a different problem. Now, when it comes to standardized testing, I can see this nicely. Nobody gives a damn what the standard deviation is anymore. Okay, was that nice? Okay, pretty much when it comes to testing. Okay, so for instance, people will say, look, by the way, for those of you on TV, I'm sick. I don't care if it dates it. So those of you who are watching tapes, those of you who are watching it two semesters after it's taped, I want you to have pity on my previous misfortune. Okay, this being taped after Labor Day weekend, all I did was lie around and suffer. All right, now. If you don't have pity, I'll tell you more. Okay, now what happens is that if I take a score and I say, gee, you know, I'm, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take these scores and I'm going to see what the mean and standard deviation is for each age group. Now the fact that in this age group there's a very small standard deviation for seven-year-olds, say, and for nine-year-olds, there's a lot, much larger standard deviation. Nobody cares anymore. Nobody cares. 
What do I care? All I want to know is how many standard deviations above or below the mean your score was. See what I'm saying? And now, of course, what that enables me to do is provided that, provided that the scores on the test distribute basically normally, they have basically a normal distribution for all age groups, I can now use this test across various age groups. Right? I can say, look, over there are my seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds, ten-year-olds, eleven-year-olds, twelve-year-olds watching it on tape, right? So what I'm going to say is, person number one, person number one, tell me your name. Push it down, push it down. Brooke. Brooks. You don't have a brother named Streams, do you? You've heard all that before, right? She's heard them all before, but why should I be different? Okay, so Brooks, what I say is for Brooks, she had, she was one standard deviation above the mean for her age group. Now the nine-year-olds, tell me your name. Brandon. Push it down, push it down. Brandon, he doesn't want to tell, he doesn't want people to know his name. Okay, Brandon was one standard deviation above the mean for his age group. So I give him the same score. Now, obviously, Brandon answered a lot more questions right than Brooks did, right? Because the average number right is higher for nine-year-olds than for seven-year-olds, right? And then I have, push it down. Oscar. Oscar. Oscar was two and a half standard deviations above the mean for his age group, right? So his high school is going to be quiet. Now, it's possible that Brooks answered more questions right than than then Oscar, especially since Oscar has just turned eight and Brandon is almost ten, right? So he'd be, it's possible, but I don't care. What I'm doing is comparing you to other people of your own chronological age. Okay? And seeing how many standard deviations above and below the mean you are. And we talked about, we ended with the idea of z-scores. So if... <coughs> So if, let's take a different person. Tell me your name. Quinita. Again? Quinita. Quinita. Quinita, let's say I have a test. And the average on the test was 80 and the standard deviation was, the standard deviation was 7. And Quinita's got an 81. How many standard deviations above the mean you figure she was, roughly? A tenth of a standard deviation above the mean, right? See what I'm saying? Maybe two tenths, right? 80. One standard deviation above the mean would be 87. That's the average deviation. You see what I'm saying? So I would say, okay, her score is 0.2. I'd like to take someone who's in good mental health. How's your mental health today? Pretty good? Okay, push it down. Tell me your name. Colleen. Again, Colleen? Okay, Colleen is her score is 75. So she's about, I don't know, 7 tenths of the standard deviation below the mean. So her score is minus 0.7. Okay. Now when the IQ people came to saying we're going to use deviation scores, they didn't use these scores for two reasons. First of all, you can't go to someone whose previous IQ was 100, right? Exactly. If, your IQ, if you have exactly the mean score, you've got exactly the score that's the average, what's your z-score? Zero. zero, right? It's zero. You need to, and say, so, well, uh, 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 what's today? Today, so she did. Mrs. So-and-so, your child's IQ used to be 100, but we've changed the scoring, and now your I kid's IQ is zero. Your child, not too bad, has an IQ of minus Point two. you imagine telling that to parents? The other problem is, what's wrong with z-scores? What do normal people hate about z-scores? Minus point two. What do you hate about that number? Not Come on, be honest. What? Push it down? Not a whole number. First of all, decimals. Those hateful things. And what else? Go ahead. It's negative. And a negative sign, right? Fooey. So people don't use z-scores anymore. Somebody came along and said, you know what? 
If I want to measure any distribution, I'm going to use T scores. Okay, here let's go to the to the overhead. A Z score equals the okay zero is the mean, right? It's the actual, and you get and it's uh, and the score, the standard deviation is the true number of Z D standard deviation, true number of standard deviations. Somebody went to the T score and he said, I can't remember his name. He said. Wait a minute. If you get the mean, I'm just going to arbitrarily give you a 50. Okay? And for every standard deviation, sorry, I mixed something up here. For every standard deviation, I'm, it's going to be worth 10 points. You get it? So come, so leave it. Okay, so what we have, if you can put my picture in the corner, that'll help. So in other words, it doesn't matter what the standard deviation really is. If you're mean, if you got the mean score, I'll give you a 50. If you got a standard deviation above the mean, I'll give you a 60. If you got two standard deviations above the mean, I'll give you 70. If you got three standard deviations below the mean, I'll give you a, a 20. You got it? Do you understand what I'm saying? Only well, push it down, push it down, push it down. Is this only for IQ tests? No, this is for all standardized tests use this. But this is a way, come back to me now, this is a way to use, to measure in standardized, using standard deviations, right? This confused me a great deal when I first learned this. Anybody want to ask any questions about this? In other words, so it does matter if your distribution is, if your mean is 82, and your standard deviation is 5, and if you've got an 87, I'll give you a 10. I'll give you a 60. I'll give you a 60. You understand that? You got one, you understand why? Let's try this. Let's go back here. Let's say you have a score where the mean is 82, and the standard deviation is 6, and you got an 88. So you're one standard deviation above the mean, right? Right? So your T score is going to equal 60. Right? 50 for the mean. One standard deviation above gives you another 10 points. Your T score equals 60. You see it? If you got, let's say the next person gets an, an 85. I don't know. Your T score will equal, I don't know, this is a guess. This is approximately, right? A C means a, a C. Put a little C in front of it means approximately, it's going to equal, I don't know, 66, something like that. 64 maybe, something like that, right? That'll be your T-score. Your T-score will be approximately 64. See what I'm saying? I don't know, you can figure it out. If I, had, if I had my statistics books, I could figure it out. Okay, come back to me now. And you can see what happens here is that now, if you're a tenth of a standard deviation above the mean, I usually don't want to be more accurate than that, you get a 51. Right? Even if you're five standard deviations above the mean, there are some scores there. Five standard deviations below the mean. I mean, there'd be uh, one, I don't know, a teeny tiny percentage below that, less than 1%, far less. Three tenths of a percent, I don't know what it is, right? You still get a zero. I wouldn't have to monkey around with all those stupid decimals and all those stupid negative signs, right? And my friends, this is what, for instance, a lot of you, who took the SAT, anybody? Yeah, that's what the SAT uses. For reasons that have to do with history, they just stick another zero on the end, right? The last zero, on the, the last number on the SAT test is always a zero, right? They just stick it. In the old day, I'll tell, I'll tell you how you know you're old. If you took an SAT test and your last number isn't as here, I remember I had a four at the end of one. Of course, they wanted to go, they went to giving you 500 instead of 50 for the mean because they wanted to go to hundreds of a DVA, standard deviation. So if you had a score that was one one hundredth above the mean, they'd give you a 501. No, they don't care about that anyway. We're just going to be nuts. 
Everything is a, so it's always a zero. However, to be fair, it's not, it's not really true. By and large, the mean is actually lower. Of course, they have this revolving mean. I think they call it a delta adjustment. They play games. They do it. They get, oh, my God. Woo, look at all those statistics. So actually, if you got a 500, you're probably above the mean, right? Most as I think, a four. They just keep constantly revising their mean based on whoever took it. IQ doesn't work that way, by the way. We'll get to that in a second. Okay? So they just, so that's how it works. Okay? Now, what happened, okay, <coughs> now, let's go back to the Apollo point. These tests, this, remember, none of this works unless you have a normal distribution. None of this works unless you have a normal distribution. So a normal distribution is the basis for calculating IQ scores, for calculating percentiles, Percentile score indicates how many people scored lower than that person on the test. We'll get to that in a second. And it gives you the scores that lead to the labels, such as retarded and learning disabled. Okay, stay on here. Okay. A percentile indicates how many people scored lower than you did on the test. So if you're right at the mean, what percentile rank are you? What's your percentile? You're Oscar, say it again. 50. 50th percentile. You see why? You see why? You don't see why. You're here. You're here. So all these people, half the people scored lower than you did. Okay? So you're in the 50th percentile. See what I'm saying? You got it? Got it? No? A percentile says what percentage of people scored lower than you did. This is the middle score, right? 50% of the people got scores in here, and 50% of the people got scores in here, right? So if you're here, 50% of the people got scores lower than you did. So you're in the 50th percentile. Let's say, for ease, ease sake, you've got a score that's one standard deviation above the mean for your group. What percentile are you in? Round it off. Somebody else, not Oscar. Are you a stati statistics major? Get away from me. What? Stat teacher. Say it again? Statistics teacher. Oh, you're a statistics teacher. Very good. He fails the course. That's just personal. I mean, when I hear the word statistics, I go, now I can take out my vengeance on him, right? My anger on him. Okay? Okay. Where do you teach statistics? In high school? Good for you. He said yes. Okay. So let's say my, my new score is right over here. Okay? What percentile am I in? Somebody aside from the statistics teacher. 15. What? 15. Say it again. 15. No, why 15th? No. Where are we? 85. Say it again. Who said 84? Push it down and say it. Nothing to push down. 84. 84. <laughs> Nothing to push down. You're in the 84th percentile. You see why? Here you're in the 50th. Now you're jumping over all of these people. You've got to score higher than all these 34% of the people. It's in the 84.13, but I'm going to ignore the, the, the decimals. See why you're in the 84th percentile here? These 50% plus these 84 got lower grades than you did. So you're in the 84th percentile. You see what I'm saying? Remember, the definition of a percentile is the number of people who scored lower than that person on the test who took the test, right? That's, okay, just come back to me for a second. That's why, that's why you can't be in the 100th percentile. If you were in the 100th percentile, you would have a higher score than everybody who took the test. <laughs> that can't be. <laughs> you took the test, get a higher score than yourself. So you're the 99.9 percentile. Okay, let's go back. Let's go back to the overhead. I mean, to the PowerPoint. Okay, go ahead. What's your question? Push it down. When you're talking about the first standard deviation, uh -huh. and and the definition it says uh, percentile score indicates how many people score lower than the person. That's right. So it should be 15 instead of no. Uh, Look, all of these people scored lower. All of these people scored lower than this person, right? You see? See what I'm saying? 
These are the higher scores. The scores goes from the lowest to the highest scores. See what I'm saying? So all of these people, this 50% scored lower, plus 30, this is 34% scored lower. See what I'm saying? If you have a score that's one standard deviation below the mean, what percentile are you in? Somebody aside from Oscar. Oscar thinks, he thinks I'm kidding that I'm going to fail him. I'm going to, I, uh, he's finished. Dr. Lieberman? Yeah. That means 16% are people who did better than you did. If you're on 84 percentile. 16 did better than you did, that's right. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. That's exactly correct. If your score is here, then this 16, there are about 16% here, it's roughly, they did better than you did. If you add this up, there's also a teeny, this comes out to a little bit less than 16, but there's a teeny little percentage over in a year. That's exactly right. 16 did better. That's exactly right. What percentile are you in if you got a score one standard deviation below? What percentile are you in? What do you get? Forget the, the, the decimals. Who's got it? What do you got? 51 did better than you, 49 did worse than you. If you're here, oops, sorry. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, we got troubles here. There we are. If you're here, what do you get? Push it down. 16. See? That makes me feel good because he didn't get the right answer before and now he's got it. Tell me your name. Amir. What? Amir. Amir made my day. Okay. So, you see what we're saying? You see what we're saying here? This 50% did better than you did. And so does this 34%, right? That's 84% who did better than you did. This 14 did worse than you did. You can see, okay, you understand what I'm saying? Two standard deviations below the mean right here. About 2.5% of the people here, two and there's a little bit here. 2.5% of the people did worse than you did, right? You're about the 2.5 percentile. This 97.5 did better than you did. And if you're here, you're probably in the, I don't know, the 47th percentile. You see that 68% of the scores are between one standard deviation below the mean and one above the mean. Over two-thirds of the scores provided that you have a normal distribution. Here, if you, let's go back to the overhead. If you have a distribution like this, let's try again. If you have a distribution like this, or a distribution like this, oops, not quite, a distribution like this, this is negatively skewed, positively skewed. None, none of these percentages are going to work. They all turn into garbage. Okay? They all turn into garbage. Okay, come back to me. So just as a, okay, so just as a hint again, thus we see that Here, let me just go back here for one second. It is determined, <sighs> it's been determined that, that anyone who has, is more than two standard deviations below the mean, i.e. in the bottom two and a half percent, that's a retarded score. That's just how it is. Okay? Gifted, gifted is usually here. Two standard deviations above the mean. We usually, we usually say, this is normal, this is low normal, this is high normal, this is bright, this is gifted, or gifted and above three is genius, that kind of stuff. This is normal, low normal, slow, retarded, profoundly severely retarded, that kind of stuff. Okay? It's based on the statistics. So thus we see, look at that, what, thus, watch, oh, see those dots shake? took me two days to figure out how to do that. Thus, 
The major consideration for determining what questions will appear on an IQ and any other standardized test is whether or not that question will contribute to achieving a standard distribution of answers on the test. Okay, come back to me and I'll explain that. First of all, let me tell you that once I was teasing somebody in class who was an undergraduate, the way I was teasing Oscar, after the class, the person runs up to the chair and says, Dr. Lieberman says, because I, that time it was age, I had just turned 50, I think. He said, anyone younger than 35 can't get hired in a C, I'm only 26. I gotta get an A in this car. <laughs> <laughs> I said to Jerry, she said, I didn't know what to say. <laughs> so anyway, <coughs> what, what we get here, the job we gave is not an easy job. I have to give a test that distributes normally across all the age groups. So if I find it all, I give it to my seven-year-olds, my seven-and-a-quarter-year-olds, my seven-and-a-half-year-olds, my seven-and-three-quarter-year-olds. It's fine. Distributes normal. Then I give it to my eight, my eight-and-a-quarter-year-olds. That's how they divided it. My eight-and-a-half-year-olds, it's fine. Nine, same thing. Get to ten. My ten-and-a-half-year-olds, it doesn't distribute normally. It's no good. Because I'm using this test with everyone. So I got a monkey and piddle and fiddle and cadiddle with the questions until it distributes normally, basically normally, across all the age groups, yeah. Is that why on some tests you have experimental questions? They're seeing where that question falls out? Very, very good, yes. Why on some tests, like on the, on the, they used to have a section on the SAT. The whole test was experimental questions to see if they fit the distribution or not, right? For instance, if you have a test, every once in a while you put out a test, all the people who got high grades get that question wrong, or many people. And many people who got low grades got that question right. We don't know why. Usually because if you think about it a little, come to a different answer and we don't want to think. How many people been told when you went in to take the SAT or the ACT don't, or the GRE, don't think too much. This is a test of your ability. Don't think too much. If you think too much, you're going to get the wrong answers. By the way, I'll give you one. I, I can't give you exact uh, IQ tests in here, but I'll give you one that'll just, I'll, I'll show you. Okay? So, I've got it right. By the way, they don't have that anymore in the SAT, the special section, because the Princeton Review, whose purpose is to show you how to scam the SAT test, right, and the GRE test, they, they showed you how to figure out which that experimental test was and skip it. That messes up their distribution. So now they, they distribute them all over the place. You understand? That's why you're told 30 minutes on this section, 40 minutes on this section. Okay? If they said to you, here, let me come back to the overhead. Look, take, just take this test home. Here, just go into that room. Go into that room and take this test. And when you're done, bring it back. Okay? This is the kind of distribution you'd get. It would skew, it would have a negative skew. A lot of people would get a lot of right answers. And not too many would be down here, rather than this one, the one that they want, right? See what I'm saying? So, for instance, they'll tell you, come back to me, they use all kinds of ways to get this. Why on some sections is it 35 minutes? Some it's 40, some it's 45. Because if on the one that's 30, if I gave you 35, too many people get it right. On the one that's 40, if I only gave you 35, too many people would get wrong answers, and I get the other kind of skew. I wouldn't get, you see what I'm saying? I have more wrong answers than I needed. All of these are games that are played. So on some IQ tests, you'll see, go until there are five in a row wrong, until there are three in a row wrong, until there are four in a row wrong. Why? It's the S word. Not that S word. Statistics. Every single question, why is this question on here? Why do you do this? Why that? Why this? Why that? Why that? Why this? The answer is always the same, to get a normal distribution. So if there's a question on an IQ test, you say, well, why did they ask with these numbers instead of those numbers? That's the reason why. Why this and why that? Okay? There's no theory. I say it's the tail wagging the dog. The questions I ask, I don't have a theory of intelligence and say, okay, let me ask these questions. questions. If you say to Piaget, why are you asking that question? He'll tell you why. 
I'm asking that to get at people's reasoning. If you ask information people, processing people, why are you doing that? Because I want to see people's use of strategies, right? If you ask these people, it's because it gives me a normal distribution. So you don't have a sense of, well, I'm, I have a, an idea of what intelligence is, then I'm going to ask these questions and see what statistics I can do. No, it's the other way around. Because if you remember, the roots of these tests are not based in any theory of intelligence. They're based in you know, the kinds of school type stuff and maybe other general type stuff that we have. Okay? So let's go back to the PowerPoint. On IQ tests, retardation is not a measure of reasonability or problem solving. Okay? Rather, it's, it's a statistical construct. They told you how many standard deviations are above or below the mean way you are. Okay? Well, some people will say, well, the question's asked, do measure your reasoning ability or problem solving? Maybe. Retardation means having an IQ score that is more than two standard deviations below the mean. Okay, come back to me for a second. Okay. Now we have to ask the question, what's on an IQ test? I'm going to take a little time to horse around here. If I were to ask you, what is intelligence, what would you tell me? By the way, whatever answer you give, I promise you, there's been a psychologist who agrees with you. This is a question you can't be wrong. It's like asking, what's your favorite color? You can't be wrong, right? So you tell me your idea, some people, and the people at home, if you want to jot it down, so we can see. Who has an idea? What would, if I would say, what is intelligence? What does it mean a person is intelligent? What would you say? The ability to do what? <coughs> Go ahead. Ascertain knowledge. Okay. Acer what does it mean by ascertain? That's a dirty word. <laughs> it's a tricky word. Gather, hold. Um, okay. Oh, so it's the ability to learn stuff. Okay? That's, by the way, right on. That's one definition that's been given by psychologists. Yeah, go ahead. I was thinking more a demonstration of knowledge, being able to show what you know. Being able to show what you know in a, in a real situation. That's right. There's another one. That's a little different from the other one, isn't it? Right on. You've, that's plenty of people have given that definition. Another one? Any other abilities? The Sorry. ability to use reasoning and logic. The ability to, to reason, to think. There are plenty of people who you give that one. Wait, so that's different from learning. Go ahead. Ability to connect. Got to tell me more. Connect what? Another sneaky word one. Go ahead. Connect what? Wait, push it down. You didn't push it down. Connect what? Different facts which you learned into a cohesive understanding. Okay. Now that, that's a little bit like the reasoning, but not quite. The ability to take various things you've learned and connect them in some meaningful way. That one's also been given. I tell you, you're not going to come up with an original one. There have been hundreds of them given. Once I think they had a conference of 100 psychologists that came up with 82 definitions of intelligence. I think the other 18 guys were off uh, playing poker or something. I don't know. By the way, where I come from, guys means people, not males or females. So I don't know what to tell you. Okay? Anything else? Okay, that's a lot of them. So you can see there are very different definitions of intelligence and the ways to do it. With IQ, we'll, we'll, we'll see what is going on. Okay, now... In order, okay, we're going to do one other thing here now. What I'm going to do, where is this? Nobody peek. The people watching this on tape, on DVD, or watching it on television, I want you to go along with me. I'm going to read some questions. And these questions, these questions have, on the questions, let's go to the overhead. You're going to have, to, you're going to, write down, you're going to write down where I took them from. You're going to put IQ, I took these questions from an IQ test. SA from a standardized achievement test. Or TC, a, a teacher classroom test. Teacher, teacher's test. Okay? Come back to me now. 
Right? I'm looking for the questions. There they are. Don't peek. Okay? What is the distance from Miami to Chicago? Did that come from an IQ test, a standardized achievement test, or a teacher classroom test? Write it down, write it down, write it down. It's like a vote. You have to vote. <laughs> write it down. Write it down. People on camera, I'm watching you too. Okay? Number two. What does the word influential mean? Or give me a definition of the word influential. I just didn't show it in, okay? Define the word influential. Okay? What kind of, you don't have to define it. Just tell where it's from. Number three. If bananas are on sale, for 50 cents a dozen, and you buy one and a half dozen, how much change would you get back for five dollars? <laughs> you don't have to figure it out. Okay? Who sailed around the Cape of Good Hope? And finally, I can't tell you the whole thing, but you're in a room with shatterproof windows. You're locked in the room, and there are a bunch of instruments, instruments in the room, and you have to, and you have to, so how do you get out of the room? The door's locked. How do you, can you get out of the room without, you know, it's a steel door. There are ways to get out of the room, right? There's more. There's an open window at the top, blah, 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 all kinds of stuff. Okay, I can't give you all the details. Take forever. Okay, you got it? Okay, first question. What was the first question? How far is it from uh, Miami to Chicago? Who put that it was an IQ test? We have four people. Who put that it was a standardized achievement test? You know, who put that it was a teacher test? Just about everybody. Number two, was that, what was that, what was, I didn't put them in order. What does the word influential mean? Wasn't that it? Who put, define, that it was an IQ test? Anybody? Three or four people? Four people. Who put that it was on a standardized achievement test? Who about half. And who put that it was, on a, that it was a teacher test? Mm, a little less than half, okay. Next one. Which one did I pick? I don't remember. Oh, the price of bananas, how much change would you get? Who put that it was a, uh, an IQ test? Four people. Who put that it was a, on a standardized achievement test? Bunch of people. Who put it was a teacher test? Three people, nobody would ask, four people, nobody would ask a teacher. Most people, don't. what was the next one? I have a bunch of them here. Uh, what was the next one? What? Oh, the who sailed around the Cape of, Good, Cape of Good Hope? Who put that it was an IQ test? Two people. Who put that it was a standardized achievement test? A couple people. Who put that it was a teacher test? Obviously everybody. And the last one about being locked in the room. Who put that it was an IQ test? Everybody. Anybody put that it was a, a, a standardized achievement test? Anybody put that it was a teacher test? Okay, want the answers? They're all from an IQ test, except the last one, which is a bunch of baloney I made up. Okay? Shocked? Now, those are, because this is on television, those are not the actual questions. So, it's not, they have two different cities. How far is it from two different cities? Define, that's not one of the words on their list of words to define. I mixed up the numbers about how much change you'd get back, right? But basically, that's it. Who's shocked? Yeah? A lot of people shocked. Who's seen IQ tests before? 
Oh, no wonder you got them all right. Okay? <clears throat> okay. This, of course, is an issue of, let's go back to the PowerPoint, of reliability, which is if the score in the test is accurate, the test is reliable. Okay, these tests are reliable. Okay, now reliability is, is an interesting kind of a notion. Here, um, come back to me. Let's uh, try something here. All right, Mir, you're sitting up front. Come over here. Just stand over here. Don't worry about it. Okay, this is another vote. Okay, with the shoes off. Take your head off, just fooling people. There you go. Oh, he's a good looking guy. What is he wearing a hat for? Don't say anything. Okay, write down how tall he is. Write it down how tall you think he is. Sorry. I'll get out of the way. <coughs> okay, I'll have it down. You write it down. Do it in feet and inches. Kind of feet and inches? Okay. Okay. Who had five five or less? Anybody? Nobody. Five six. Anybody? Nobody. Five seven. Nobody. Five eight. Nobody. Five nine. One person. Five ten. Bunch of people. Five eleven. Anybody have over five eleven? How, who had who had six foot? Six one. Six two. Anybody have anybody have over six two? How old did you have? Six three. Six three. Two six threes. It's about five eleven. How tall? Yeah, five eleven. Five eleven. Okay. Now watch this. Okay. Don't go away. Okay. The first, that is not a terribly reliable method. Take a look and what do you think? Okay? Take a look and what do you think? Okay? Nobody said 5'5", five five, nobody said 6'7", so it's got some reliability. I used a slightly more reliable method. I stood up next to him, I know I'm a little under 5'11", and I know with my shoes off, I have heels, he doesn't. I'd be a little bit shorter than he is, so 5'11". My method's a little bit more reliable, especially with people who are about my height. Okay? Who can give me a more reliable method for measuring how tall he is? What? What would be a more reliable? Tape measure. Take a tape measure. <laughs> that would be more reliable. We wouldn't get any 6'2's. But if he's exactly 5'11", let's assume he's exactly 5'11", we'd get from 5'10 and a half to 5'11 and a half, I promise you. Do you ever go to the doctor and they got those things just standing and they stick that bar on your head? And you go to the doctor, to say, two different doctors in a week and they are half an inch off on what they measure? Those things are eh, they're all right. But they're not perfect, okay? But the yardstick is certainly, or the tape measure is certainly more reliable. By the way, a tape measure would be more reliable than a yardstick. Because the yardstick, they have to stick down here and then I have to put my finger on it and come up here. Where the yardstick, with a tape measure, I could go all the way, right? Don't worry, I'm not going to hit you. <laughs> okay? So you see, so, and then, now I'm going to take laser beams, and I'm going to triangulate from three different places, and I'm going to get, uh, bing, 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 and I get, right, 5, 5, 11.172938 inches. Then I take laser beams from over there, and I three different places, and I get 5.1237 inches. Do it over there, I get eight, seven, I can get it to within one one-thousandth of an inch, okay? Okay, give me a big hand, thank you very much. Okay? So we have methods, right? Guess, sort of stand up next to him and figure from your own height, that's a little better. Use a yardstick, that's a little better. Use a tape measure, a little better. Finally, we're going to, I could actually stand him up against a wall, against marks, like they do in the lineup, you haven't committed any crimes lately, have you? In the lineup, that would probably be even a little bit, maybe a little bit better, probably not too much than the tape measure. And then finally, I can try, right? Very, I get more and more reliable, okay? But there's another question, let's go back to the PowerPoint, and of course, that's the question of validity. Is the test measuring what it claims to measure? If it does, it's valid. 
So the question is, what in the heck is this IQ test measuring? Okay, let me show you an example of validity. I'm here, come back over here. Come back over here. Let's try somebody else. How tall are you? Five ten. Stand next to him. Pretty good. Let's try somebody else here. Oh, you're taller than I thought you were. <coughs> Move over a little. We're going to stand. In, we're going to stand in order of height. Stand over here. Maybe you're not. <laughs> okay. How tall are you? She's five two. Maybe you're not. Anybody shorter than five two? Who's about five six five seven? All I got to do is stand here. Anybody over six foot? Yeah, we had one person over six foot here, didn't we? Sitting over here last time. Okay, I want one more person. Pretty cool. How tall are you? She's five eight. She says, "Okay, stand over there." Is that right? Yeah, I'll be damned. Okay, now what I do. I have these five people, and I have triangulated. Do you have heels on? Oh, no. two of you. Take them off, all right? Because the two of you look about the same height. Okay, there, that's better. I'm looking on TV. Good, good. I have done a triangulation, and I have their heights to one one thousandth of an inch. And now I have a measure of basketball skill. Worst basketball player, a little better, a little better. Almost the top, the top basketball player. You want to go in basketball? A little bit. What about you? No. What about you? Nope. What about you? No. What about you? Horrible. Who's pretty good in basketball? Who's okay, at least pretty good? How tall are you? Hmm. Anybody shorter than that who's pretty good in basketball? All right. How tall are you? 5'8". Five eight. Five eight. All right. Stand over here. Thank you. Never mind. Okay. So the, there we go. That's better. Okay. So the best basketball player is actually the best basketball player is actually over here, not down there. Okay. I'm going to stand where I belong, right here. In high school, the, in junior high school, what we call middle school now, the coach said to me, he said, Lieberman, your passing is average. Your shooting is a little below average. Your dribbling is also a little below average. But when you try to put them together, you are the worst basketball player <laughs> that I ever saw. If I can just stand and pass, I'm okay. Or just stand, everybody get out of the way, I'm going to take a shot. <laughs> Don't bother me, I'm going to dribble. The minute it came to a game, or the minute I had a dribble to shooting, right, it was, it was embarrassing. I was awful. Tell me your name. Allie? Allie. I promise you that if Allie and I would play one-on-one -on -one basketball, she'd beat me 19 to 1. I promise you. You don't believe it, do you? I am the world's worst <laughs> basketball player. The worst. I used to play kick-out. What would happen? <laughs> this was an intramurals. The captain of our team would go, to go and tell me to go pick a fight with the best player on the other team. And then we both get kicked out. Losing me <laughs> made no difference. No. One day I had a guy who was goading me. He wouldn't take the go. So finally I reached out and I, reached out and I pulled his jock strap. He turns around. I pull and I duck and he takes a swing. I go run across it. Kicked, coach kicked us both out. My team won the game by 20 points. Finally the coach caught out. The captain of our team was a, really a good athlete, the best one in the school. And he was on the basketball team. The real basketball team played the other schools. He said, Arthur. If Lieberman ever does that again, your team is forfeiting the game. So I just sat around on the bench and did nothing, <laughs> right? Awful. So even though we've got all our heights to one one thousandth of an inch, I better take my shoes off and stuff here. To one one thousandth of an inch, there we go. One one hundred thousandth of an inch accurate, it's not a very good measure of basketball skill. Now it's true, 
right? Taller basketball players are probably better. You know, height helps, but it's not a very good measure. Anybody remember Spud Webb? Guy was 5'3". He was a great player because he could jump seven miles in the air. Okay? Calvin Murphy. Calvin Murphy, I once, I once saw him. He came to a school where I was teaching a class early in the morning. He's a normal-looking human being. He's 5'10". It's unbelievable. You see a basketball player go like this. I remember my son, when he was a little kid, was watching the basketball game. He said, Daddy, how come all our referees are midgets? Right? <laughs> but Calvin Murphy, he's, he's a normal... Uh, of course, he has hands this big. That, interesting enough, is very difficult. He can't play professional basketball unless he can palm a ball in the men's leagues. Right? He has huge hands. I remember he was an anti-drug thing and was holding up his hands to make a point, and he had big hands. But even that, oh, the bigger your hands, the better basketball player you are. Please give me a break. All right, thank you all very much. Good job. Thank you. So you have to be careful if you have a measure, and it's a very, very accurate measure, to ask yourself, yeah, but what is it measuring? I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. The first measure of intelligence, I kid you not, was skull size. What is the size of a per let's First of all, let's try this. Let's try this. We're going to take another vote. It's all about intelligence, so you'll get how full of politics this is. Okay, here's your votes. Women have bigger brains than men. Men have bigger, bigger brains than women. On the average, obviously, there's no difference. Who votes that women have bigger brains than men? One person. Who votes that men have bigger brains than women on the average? One person. Who votes there's no difference? Everybody. Have you lost your minds? Now you can come over here. Come over here. You, he, he, he's getting extra pay because he's been up here three times. Now you can wear your hat. It doesn't matter. Okay? Okay, now these are three men who are probably average height, maybe a little bit taller than average. Four. Let's try this now. How tall are you? Any women here about five, 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 six? They're a little bit shorter than average. How tall are you? Come over here. Stand in front. Now look at these three people in the back and the three people in the front. Now on the average, who do you think has bigger, a bigger scalp and bigger bones? Obviously the three men, right? These are probably... Who do you think has bigger livers on the average? Bigger hearts? Come on, you think that her heart is the same size as his? Have you lost your mind? You think her kidneys are the same size as his? Look at how big he is compared to her. You think, what did I leave out, that her lungs are the same size as his? Even if we took bone mass, these two people about the same height, his bone mass is going to be heavier than hers, bigger than hers, or longer than hers. Right? What size shoes do you wear? They're about the same height. Nine. What do you wear? Eleven. Right. And that's a woman's nine and a man's eleven. That's typical. His feet are bigger than hers. Obviously, everything's bigger on the men. Why shouldn't the brain be bigger? So it's clear. If your eyes are bigger, you can see better. If your nose is bigger, you can smell better. If your ears are bigger, you can hear better. If your fingers are bigger, you have a better sense of touch. So if your brain is bigger, you're smarter. They all make the same amount of sense. Obviously, women have bigger, on the average, have smaller brains than men. But what does that have to do with it? Okay, give him a hand. Thank you very much. I know I loaded a little. I took tall men and shorter women, except for one. But in the end, people were going and measuring skull size. And first they poured rice into skulls. People said, well, that's not accurate. It passes, packs down. There were big articles about it. And then finally they said, oh, they're preparing ball bearings in there so you can get an exact average. Somebody will pack the rice tighter, but ball bearings won't pack... And they were using this as measures of intelligence. This is in a book called, let's go to the overhead, called The Mismeasure. You really ought to read it. It reads like a great book. It's like a novel. The Mismeasure of Man 
by Stephen Gould. I think Stephen, The Mixed Measure of Man by Stephen Gould. I think it's PH is Stephen. But the Gould is right. He just passed away a few years ago. He wrote a lot of interesting books. Okay? And in this book, he wrote about IQ tests and about measuring intelligence by measuring, come back to me now, by measuring skull size. Here, wait. Stay there for one second. The mismeasure of, I can get this erased. Mismeasure of man. There we go. Okay, come back to me if you can. Okay? <coughs> and he said they both make the same amount of sense. By the way, that's how they prove the innate superiority of the Caucasian race over the Mongolian race and the Negro race. That's where race comes from. This idea of trying to, right? <laughs> the Caucasian skulls were the biggest, and then the Mongolian skulls and the African skulls. Well, you can imagine where that came from. Obviously, they took the skulls of people in Scandinavia for the Caucasian skulls, right? Because they're big. You're darn tootin' when they took the quote-unquote Negro skulls, they didn't take Watusis, right? There, there are people in Africa whose average height, I think, is 6'7 for the men, 6'8. They're very tall. Very big and tall. Well, you're damn tootin'. You're darn tootin' that they have, you know. So they picked a small tribe. There. And then when the American Indians came, they went to an island when they were small statured people and picked their, you know, they went into their graves and picked their skulls and showed them. It's ridiculous. What is, by the way, the guy who did all the work, he left his, his uh, brain to science, and his brain turned out to be smaller than average. <laughs> okay, so, so sometimes the fates are God or whoever you, you know, get, it's ridiculous. What does one have to do with the other? So you have to ask yourself, let's go back to the overhead, uh, to the PowerPoint if we can. Is this test measuring what it claims to be measuring? Okay, that's the question. That's the question. Okay, come back to me for a second. And of course, you're going to have to ask yourself, you're going to have to ask yourself, what does this test measure? Now we're going to go over the test. I can't give you, I have it here, I can't give you exact items, but, and for a reason I'll explain in a second, but you're going to have to ask, in Texas, legally, and in many states, I think most states, Learning disabilities is defined as the difference between your innate ability and your achievement, that there's a significant gap. And IQ Q is used to measure innate ability. <coughs> and you're going to have to decide whether you think that's true. There are a lot of other issues that go with it. But before we do that, I want to look at the IQ test and how it looks. Let's go to the PowerPoint. Okay. The IQ test is divided into two subtests. By the way, you'll notice it's not a Q anymore. There's no quotient anymore. There's no division, but it's still called IQ. Yeah, you got a question? Come back to me until I get the question answered. Are there two different IQ tests that exist? Okay, come back to me if you can. Okay. The IQ test that was the going IQ test was the Stanford Binet, revised and originally done by the people who came back from studying with Binet. Then David Wexler came along, and he, and he, I believe he's the one who went to deviation IQ. And the arrests followed. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure. And he developed all his Wexler's tests, the one that started with a W. So he developed, here, let's go to uh, the overhead. He developed the WISC. We're now in the WISC 3 or 4. The Wexler, here's Wexler. Can you see that? Yeah. The Wexler. David Wexler. David Wexler. The Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children and the WACE, the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale. There's even something called the WIPSI. Wexler Pre-Primary Scale of Intelligence. I think we're on the R here or on three. and the, These have been revised several times, okay? So those are the two. Come back to me. And this is... Come back to me if you can. These are the most common. The Wexlers are the most common one. The Wace, I mean the Whisk and all that stuff. Then the Stanford Binet, but there are several others. Some people said, oh, well, these things are biased for language, so there are nonverbal tests of IQ. There are all kinds of tests out there. Okay? Let me say that, that what happened <coughs> on the IQ tests 
is that when they came along, I didn't finish the discussion of the T-test, they said when they went to distribution tests, what are we going to do? So they said, they said, look, what they said, let's go back here, is that we got to try to keep it the same as it used to be. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you a hundred. If you got the average score for your age, instead of giving you a zero or a 50, we're going to give you a hundred. Okay? So that way this, the, the average IQ stayed a hundred. And for the standard deviation, we're going to give you 15 points. That's the, that's the Wexler. And 16 points, the Stanford Binet gives you 16 points. I don't know why, maybe just politics. You understand what I'm saying? So if you're two standard deviations above the mean on the Wexler, you have an IQ of 130 and Stanford Binet of 132. That's what they do. They just arbitrarily said it's 100. If you're a standard deviation above the mean, we'll add another, 100, another 15 points. Right? That's what we're going to do. So two, two standard deviations below the mean on the Wexler would be how much? Let's go back. If you're two standard deviations below the mean, what would your score be? 70. 70. So below 70 is retarded. That's how they got it. Okay? Come to me if you can, okay? Now, there are a lot of questions to ask, like, is intelligence just one thing? All the complex things that people think about and know about, can you boil it down to one number? But here's how, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Here's how it works, okay? You have a verbal IQ and a performance IQ. The verbal IQ has five questions on them, Informa five subtests, information test, a similarities test, an arithmetic test, a vocabulary test, and a comprehension test. And the performance also has five subtests. A picture completion test, a picture arrangement test, a block design test, an object assembly test, and a coding test. They're fancy words there. They're pretty easy, okay? So what I do now, what happens <coughs> as each test is developed, it is given to a, a, what's quote unquote a representative group of children. And everyone whose IQ is measured is compared to all of those children who originally took it until the next test comes out. And then you're compared to the new group of children. So your five, these tests are added up, standard deviation added up. Your deviation score is figured. Of course, there's nothing to it. There's a table in the back of the manual. I'm not doing anything. And that gives you your verbal IQ. Then these five are added up. We see how many standard deviations above and below the mean you are. And that gives you performance IQ. Then all 10 are added up. We see how many standard deviations above or below the mean you are. And that gives you your general IQ. Now, it's not a division. So you can have a verbal IQ of 110. Because of the nature of statistics, a performance IQ of 102. And your regular IQ is 103 or 108. Depends on you, right? You understand what I'm saying? Can't say, well, it's 100. 100 and 110, it's 105. No, that's not right. It'd come up, but it's close. It can never be lower than this one or higher. It's somewhere in the middle of the two. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? That's how it works. Okay, come back to me. So now, now what we're going to do, now what we're going to do, I'm going to get an IQ test. I'm going to go through these one at a time. Now let me tell you something. The questions on these tests are secret which in and of itself ought to tell you what's wrong with this. Because somebody could, somebody could get the answers and memorize it all, right? <laughs> so that means that different exposure items on the test gives you a different IQ. Okay? So what I'm going to have to do, because this is on television, is I'm going to take out a manual from an older test. Doesn't really matter. And I'm just going to make up questions that are similar. So let's go back to the PowerPoint for one second. The information part, OK? I'm going to start with the information. And here's what the information is. Ready? Come, to, come back to me. The information is not on this page. 
Here are some information questions. Now, on different tests, it's in different order. What you do is you go one verbal, one performance, one verbal, one performance, and one performance, one verbal, one performance, one verbal. Sometimes they scramble the order, but it doesn't make any difference. I mean, the point is the same. Okay, here it is. What is the capital of Peru? Lima. Okay, Lima, you know, right? Okay, now that's not the question on here. I'm taking this from the Intelligence Scale for Children, the Wexler. Of course, they're asking what's the capital of a different country, but it's, that's the idea. Okay? I got to give you one that they've taken off. Let them sue me. How tall is the average American man? This is not on the new one, because I think people thought it was too silly. Any answer from 5'7 to 5'11. Do not, not as in italics, that's why I said it that way, do not give credit for 5'6 and a half or 5'11 and a half. Why not? There's only one answer. Why not? Why do they pick 5'7 and 5'11? Not 5'7 and a half to 5'10 and a half. Why? Push it down? To get the standard deviation. To get the right, that's, that's the height you had to get to get the, the normal distribution. To get the normal distribution. That's the only answer to any question. It gives you a normal distribution. I already gave you one. How far is it from, from Chicago to Miami to Chicago? Except there's two different cities. In what continent? I'll give you another one that's for real. By the way, it's very similar. On the adult test, they had a question on one of the old ones. I think it's gone. In what continent is Egypt? Okay. Now, the answer they want is Africa. But let them sue me again. But the theoretical dividing line between Africa and Asia, does anybody know what it is? What's the theoretical dividing line between Africa and Asia as you go east? Where do you say you're in Asia now? What? You're going, you're going across the Sahara Desert, you're in Africa, and then what do you, when do you say, I'm in Asia now? Red sea. So, wh who said that? Red sea. Push it down, say it again. After Red Sea. You cross the Red Sea, you're in the Asia. What is it? Say that again? Red Sea. Not, not, well, it used to be the Red Sea, but now it's something artificial. It's the, the Suez Canal, right? It's the Red Sea. But the Red Sea will, will put Saudi Arabia in, uh, in Asia and... Uh, What's on the other side? Ethiopia and Africa. But as you go across the north, the Suez Canal is considered the line. Well, which means that the Sinai Peninsula, which is part of Egypt, right? The last few years, the last 30 years or so, right, up and back, it's part of Egypt, is in Asia. Now, it's true, most of Africa, most of Egypt is in Asia, but the Suez, but the Sinai Peninsula, which is on the other side, you keep going until you hit the, the border of Israel, right? And down until you hit the Red Sea and up until you hit the Mediterranean Sea is bigger than Lebanon, bigger than Israel, bigger than Bahrain, bigger than United Arab Emirates, bigger than Qatar or Qatar, however you say it, Qatar. It's a big chunk of land. Well, they got rid of it. it like any of these tests, if you think too much or you know too much, you're probably going to get the wrong answer. Okay, here, let's see more. Who invented, who invented the Reaper? Okay, it's a different person. Why the Reaper and not the sewing machine? Why do they ask that particular person? Why? Oscar Teller! Go ahead, you know. So push it down. You fit the curve. It's the one that gives you the normal distribution. I've got to give you another one that's real. It's not in the, in the new one anymore. I'll give you the old one. Name the two countries that border the United States. They want Canada and Mexico. But in fact, there's another country that borders the United States. What is it? Think about it. Russia borders the United States. Some of the Aleutian Islands belong to Russia. Some Aleutian Islands belong to the United States. And the distance across them, right, there's no international water. There's a line in the water. As a matter of fact, across the Bering Strait, I believe, is less than 24 miles. We recognize three miles. The Russians recognize 12. As far as they're concerned, there's no international water between the, in the Bering Strait. There's a line down the middle of it. This side of the United States has a, So, if, But if you know too much, you get it wrong. But certainly at the Aleutians there, 
I think the Russians own two or three of the Aleutians, right? And there's two of those on there, very close to each other. And the border is a line right down the middle in the water. Okay? Which means we border them. <sighs> How many nickels make a quarter? That kind of stuff. How many toes do you have? That kind of stuff. Okay? So that's the first question. The next one, let's go back to the PowerPoint briefly, is similarities. I'm just going to give them in this order so you get the idea. Ready? Similarities. Okay, I'm going to give you two things. Okay, come back to me. And you're going to tell how they're the same. How are a river and an ocean the same? I'll give you, okay, how are, uh, I don't know, a peach and a tomato the same? How are a, I mean, I'm making these up because I can't give the real ones. How are a, uh, 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 a banjo and a trombone the same? Well, let's try this, a banjo and a, and a flute the same. Because you get two right answers, okay? By the way, on the, on the, First one, on the information, you go until the child gets five consecutive failures. On this one, the information, you go until the child gets four consecutive failures. Why five in the first one or four in the second one? Why? Somebody tell me. That's how you get the normal distribution. Somebody's going like this in the air. Right, good. That's how you get the normal distribution. If you, allowed, if you made four in the first one, there'd be too many wrong answers. The distribution would skew over if you allowed five in the second one. Okay? So on this one, you know, how are top and bottom the same? How are a television and a tape recorder the same? Etc. How are a coat and a shoe the same? What I'm doing is I'm giving the exact thing. I'm just changing the stuff a little. Okay? How are, uh, I don't know, a valley and a river the same? Okay? Arithmetic. Okay? Arithmetic. That's the third one. Let's go back to the PowerPoint for a second. Arithmetic is the third one. And these are math problems. When I have asked why, come back to me, why? Is this verbal? The only answer that I can get is, well, you can't use pencils and paper. You've got to give the answer aloud. This is one-fifth of your verbal IQ, remember, because there are five tests. Okay. Okay. A, uh, an employee earns earn $45. He was paid $9 an hour. How many hours did he work? Not enough, okay? Um, uh, Samantha has a seven dolls. She lost one. How many does she have now? These are for the little kids, okay? The younger the kid is, the older the kid is, you, start, you leave off the first questions, right? But you get the principle here. So, for instance, a, a, a question that you start with six-year-olds is like counting things. Well, you don't do that. Eight-year-olds, you say, if I count a thing... In two pieces, how many will I have? That's a real question. Let them sue me, right? Okay. The, the 11 to 13 year olds, you start. Johnny had uh, 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 10 toy soldiers. He bought, bought eight more. How many did he have all together? And you have a certain time limit in which you're allowed to answer this. Okay. Now, once again, if you think too much, it's no good. Okay. You have to write down this answer. I have a minute. At seven cents each, how much will three pencils cost? <laughs> Write it down. At seven cents each, how much will three pencils cost? Who put 21 cents? Every one of you who put 21 cents, I want you to go into a store. I want you to buy three things that cost $7, put $21 down on the counter, and try to walk out. That's wrong. That is wrong. The answer is, I don't know. What jurisdiction are you in? Is there sales tax? That is the wrong answer. 
for almost every place. Delaware doesn't have a sales tax and a few other places. The answer in Houston, Texas is I think what? 22 cents, 23 tenths? It's just wrong. But if you think too much, oh, what about the tax? I don't know what you do if the kid says, I don't know how much is the tax in the jurisdiction where the kid brought the pencils. <laughs> but if the kid says, that's wrong. 21 is the answer they want. And if the kid says 23 because the kid is figuring the tax where he lives, it's wrong. When we get back, I'm going to show you one that's on the, right, the present test, okay, that is, shows you what is fundamentally wrong with, that, with, with these tests. They're always ludicrous questions. So let's take a break. When we get back, I'll, I'll show them to you. Okay.